Eric Siegel, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Thanks, Meg. Burlington native, and yeah. um, you're coming back to tell us a little bit about the AI playbook and the work that you do. Uh, just if you can tell me a little bit about your background and maybe what led you to write this book and or get involved in this idea of um, AI machine learning. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great to be here and uh, talk to my hometown, Burlington, about the book or anything else about AI you want to talk to. I graduated from BHS, Bur Burlington High School, in 1987. Um, eventually, I was a, a professor at Columbia University where I got my PhD, and I've been in, in the field of machine learning for more than 30 years, an independent consultant for 20, and now the founder of a new AI startup called Gooder, or co-founder of Gooder AI. And... Uh, and this book just came out in February. It's my second book, The AI Playbook. Tell me, I'm curious, my grandson saw this book and said, what, what's that picture? What's that, can you tell me a little bit about this cover and how well, this that, relates to this story? So the, sling, yeah. the slingshot launching technology, right, is, is what the book's about, which is to actually get the technology launched. So predictive AI or predictive analytics, those types of use cases of machine learning are for targeting marketing, fraud detection, what have you. They're learning from data to predict. And ultimately, that's what machine learning does, even when it's being used for generative AI, which is sort of a whole other thing. But learning from data to predict which individual customer will click buy, lie, or die, whether this is a good place to drill for oil, whether this satellite's going to run out of battery, whether this train wheel is going to break down. Any and all outcomes and behavior for which it could be useful for an organization to predict in order to improve large-scale operations. Operations, the big main things that organizations do, whether they're nonprofits or corporations, including fundraising, um, in, including in credit risk management, all the main things insurance companies do and pretty much every corporation consist of many decisions and the holy grail for improving those decisions is predicting, is put it, putting a probability on those types of outcomes click, buy, lie, or die, or whatever it is that you're, whether it's for a human or an individual product or a, a car that might run out of battery or re require maintenance, whatever it is. So um, the dilemma that's happening in enterprises in general is that the core technology is sound, the analytics, the number crunching part. You learn from that data to predict, but then it's a whole other thing to actually act on those predictions. And that piece is called the, the deployment, the launch, like, this uh, uh, slingshot, slingshot. Yeah. <laughs> um, right? That's the part of the project that most often fails. And in fact, most new machine learning projects fail to launch. They fail to deploy. Other words for that is operationalization, um, integration, putting into production, whatever you want to call it. You've got the number crunching. It learns a model, right? It, 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 it derives a model that then predicts for each individual case but then those predictions aren't systematically acted on. And that's what you need to actually gain from this technology, to get value from it, is to integrate it, change existing operations. They're not gonna improve if they don't change, but more specifically, change them by using probabilities. So that's the value proposition of predictive analytics. That's what my first prior book called Predictive Analytics um, covers, and so does this book. But this book is more focused on, hey look, how do we position and use this technology within any kind of organization so that the project succeeds and you actually get to that last step where you actually realize value. Yeah, so I'm interested in a couple of things. One, the size of the organizations that you're thinking about and working with and how that can, how this can be worked. But you developed this term called biz ML. Yeah. Um, which is the six steps um, that you've developed around yeah. this deployment. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and maybe just give us a shortcut to what those six steps are? Yeah, so Biz, BizML is the organizational solution that I present in the book. It's a six-step practice playbook paradigm to, to run these projects so that they are ushered successfully through to deployment, so that, that they're, you've got reverse planning strong enough so you know exactly where this project's meant to be headed, how operations are meant to be changed. You're focusing on the business value, the operational improvements, rather than only the core number crunching. I mean, today, what, ha what happens is it's sort of like we're more in love with the rocket science than the launch of the rocket, right? It's, it's very ironic. Um, but if we have the right practice in place so that we're framing these projects as business operations improvement and focus on their value, 
rather than this awesome, amazing, cool number crunching, which is why I got into the technology and probably most data scientists in the first place. I mean, there's nothing cooler than, in terms of science and technology, than learning from data to predict. It's a very generally applicable, awesome, and amazing, incredible, interesting thing, but it's not valuable until you actually act on those predictions, right? So let's take a step back, reframe these projects, and orient them. That's what the six step practice that this book focuses on in the central six step chapters, you know, outline those six steps. But even if that on the surface looks like the main contribution of the book, I think there's a more fundamental contribution I'm focusing on, which is that business side people, non-data scientists, people who don't have as much of a quantitative background, do need to get involved in some of the details. You need to ramp up on a certain very accessible, semi-technical understanding of what's predicted, how well, and what's done about it. Like real concrete specifics about the project and how it's going to provide value. In order to then participate, and more than anything, more than advanced technology and better data scientists, these projects need you, if you're not a data scientist, having ramped up on that content, to then participate, collaborate deeply. It's a prerequisite for that much needed collaboration to ramp up first on that semi-technical understanding of how these projects work so that then you can participate in that sixth step. So I'd say that's more fundamental. That's what the book is designed to do is to deliver that semi-technical understanding to any reader. Yeah, and is that something that you're expecting leadership to take on as that semi-technical or are they are you encouraging folks to bring in kind of those translators to be the project managers, to be the integrators? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. This is a leadership topic, right? This BizML, the six-step practice presented by the book, is a leadership paradigm. Um, somebody's got to lead the project, right? Who it is really depends on the, on the organization. The analytics translator may be the person or may other, otherwise be an integral role there the existing manager, even the data scientists, if they're the one who spearheaded the project in the first place, could sort of switch and take a business leadership role. Um, typically, if not, if they're still doing the core number crunching, because it's really hard to not lose the forest for the trees when you're involved in that, in the, in the actual number crunching. Um, but you do, you need a leader and you need one that takes on that, um, <laughs> sort of very aggressively focusing on the business value to compensate away from, from the syndrome that we're experiencing so often with these projects, which is to be too enamored and focused on uh, the technology itself. Yeah. Um, before we get too far into it, talk, give us again that little um, de definition, the difference between predictive AI and generative AI, which may be the thing people are yeah, generative AI. enamored of. And then why you refer to it as machine learning. Mm -hmm. You kind of quickly in the book switch from AI to machine learning. Yeah, well, so. first, first and <clears throat> foremost, I've, I've, gra I've been gr um, less and less enamored with the term AI for many years. I taught the graduate courses in AI and machine learning at Columbia uh, starting in the late 90s. Um, I fell in love with the concept uh, and brand of AI when I was a kid. Uh, now, I see it as hogwash. So I think that the concept of artificial intelligence is really, really great and cool and fun for science fiction, for philosophy, perhaps for anthropology, such as sort of looking at the human race. Hey, they're trying to rec replicate themselves, you know. But if you're trying to define a technology, if you're trying to describe a goal of something that you're building, you have to define exactly what you want that thing to do. The term intelligence is nothing if not subjective, very much something about people. If you're talking about a machine and try to ascribe the word intelligence, it's a problem. We can't define it because we can't agree on the definition because there's no satisfactory definition of intelligence in the context of engineering, yeah. Yeah. right? Any specific thing, like it can play chess, it can drive a car, that, that's narrow, so it's fine. If you want to call it intelligence, the problem is that once you get the machine to do something like that, it no longer qualifies in the spirit of what people generally think of as far as AI. The only thing it does qualify is artificial general intelligence, AGI. So AGI is sort of the underlying message that that underlies most of the hype. It's the stated intention of OpenAI and of many other endeavors. But it simply means a computer that can do any intellectual task a person can do. In other words, an artificial human. I believe that is an entirely unrealistic expectation, at least in, in the near term. Or to be more, a, little, a little more precise, I believe it's a myth to think that we are 
making active, concrete progress toward AGI. I'm not saying that it's theoretically impossible or that in some number of thousands of years or what have you, but nothing in current technology, including generative AI, which can generate and chat and interact in English and other human language in a very uncanny, seemingly human-like way, including that, Nothing represents concrete steps towards AGI, which is a much more ambitious task than people generally uh, often recognize. You know, it's just. So is your feeling on that when you say nothing is, can come close to replicating a human? That's sort of like what I'm hearing you say. Is that based on your understanding of, of tech and the algorithms that are going into this? Or is that based on a philosophical understanding? Or is that based on you no, know, it's, a great, it's a great question. You put something into and you go yeah. like, you can, like, that wasn't written by a human. <laughs> that right. was well, written by some, AI. Yeah, but sometimes when you interact with these chatbots, you're like, whoa, it really seems like, because we've never seen anything like that. I was in the Natural Language Processing mm -hmm. research, and research Group at Columbia as a grad student for six years. Yeah. It's all edge cases. I never thought I'd see anything like that. But, um, no, I'm not saying we could never replicate it, okay? I don't mean that it's theoretically impossible. I think it's a lot harder than people give it credit for, and I do not think we're making any specific concrete progress. So the notion your, that we yeah, are, are that so the notion that we are making progress toward it yeah. is unfalsifiable. It's also sort of like worrying about alien invasions, right? You can make claims we should really be worried about this. We're headed that way, but it's a ghost story. There's no basis for it. There's no evidence. It's a leap of faith, and. You know, you can't disprove an unfalsifiable claim. That's what unfalsifiable means. So just like any, but you can question it just like any other um, incredible unfalsifiable statement. And that's what I'm doing. I'm like pushing back. I'm like, no, there's no particular reason to think that we're actively headed towards a machine that all of a sudden will erupt spontaneously em emergent capabilities that are sort of all encompassing and be like a person. It's a myth, but it's a very potent myth it's a great brand, mm -hmm. it's, or that is to say it's an effective, powerful brand. I don't think that we're headed that way, but that's the notion that underlies, either implicitly or explicitly, a vast majority of the hype, the inflated expectations, and, and, and that's bad, right? Hype is bad because there's a big difference between what's going to happen and what people are expecting, mm -hmm. which leads to disappointment, disillusionment, a crash, right? Like, but it's, it doesn't it's mean costly. that people aren't potentially losing their jobs with this current iteration of how yeah. generative AI is being deployed. Yes, right? sure. Well, with, the impacts. but I don't believe it's <clears throat> threatening employment nearly as much. I think that the concern about that is greatly inflated because that kind of goes along with this thing is becoming all capable like a human, and it's not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think like with any technology, I mean, that's what computers and technology and machines in general are for. They're to automate. They're to do things that otherwise we'd have to do manually, right? So that's always going to create economic shifts. I don't think the current economic shifts, because the thing can write first drafts of marketing collateral, are going to be mind-blowingly any different than the other kinds of shifts that we generally experience. Yeah. So we talked, you went in a little bit. Um, I'm curious about the six steps. Do you have shortcut? Do you have shortcut um, headlines for each of those steps? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I can I can summarize the six steps. It's they almost write themselves once you look at the particulars of what those types of projects. But just to just to couch it and sort of go back to a question I didn't quite get to: predictive AI versus generative, yep, right? Thank you. So both of them are ways of using machine learning. So learn from data to predict. Generative is literally to generate a new content item, written text, uh, an image, um, video sound, music, a new content item. In fact, the word generative is not a reference to any particular technology or technical approach. It's just that you're using this stuff to generate a new content item. That's cool, right? It writes a first draft. That can be really useful in a lot of ways. Generally can't be considered a final draft. You need a human to proofread it before it gets to the end customer or before it's posted on a billboard or whatever, however yeah. you're, you're going to use it. Um, because it's general, that's the irony when you go to generative versus predictive. So predictive is the established use cases have been around for decades. It's older, but it's not old school. The vast majority of, of its pot potential hasn't yet been, been tapped, um, largely because these, those projects failed to deploy to date, and we need to sort of rejigger them so that they do. Um, 
So, but predictive is what you turn to to improve your existing large-scale operations. So oftentimes, it's very much got greater returns and more value than, hey, let's start having the machine write the first draft of this content rather than a human, which also has some value. And in some cases, you see that it makes things 30% uh, more efficient, right? Things happen about a third more quickly. Things like that. That's great. Fine. Um, so... Um, my book, this playbook uh, covering BizML, is for the predictive projects specifically. And I think that that's where we should focus at least half of our energy on, even though the headlines and the flashy object everyone's looking at is, is generative. And generative is really, really cool. It's definitely the coolest, most impressive technology. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the most valuable. Yeah. Um, uh, but a similar process is also required to make value of generative. because. Um, in both cases, we need to be focused not just on this gleaming object of something that learns from data or generates new content that usually would require a human to generate, but what's going to be the value? So how are you going to deploy it? What are the operations or processes that are going to now be changed or improved? Exactly in what way? How are you going to measure the effectiveness? Yeah. Actually measure the effectiveness? This is sort of a rarity, so it's just sort of the practical stuff. For the, for the predictive ones, which is the BizML practice, the six steps are break down really simply. Um, the first three correspond to that semi-technical understanding I was talking about. What's predicted, how well, and what's done about it. So they basically correspond, not in that order, to a pre-production phase where everyone's got to get on the same page. We're going to predict who's going to respond to this marketing in order to target the marketing. We're going to predict which transactions are fraudulent um, in order to decide which credit card transactions to automatically block, right, or which hospital um, transactions to be audited or whatever it is. There's a million ways that this technology, I mean, is being it's, it's so, yeah, yeah. And, it, and has potential because it's just what's predicted and what's done about it. That's the pair that defines the value proposition, the use case, how well, that's the other thing, that's the focus of my startup, good or AI. And then the other three steps are just the actual technical steps, which any data scientist will tell you this is what you need to do. You need to prepare the data, train the model, that's the core rocket science, learning from data to predict to generate that model, and then use the model, deployment. So that's that's the culminating step, step six of, uh, of six, is the actual deployment. That's what you plan from the first step. Yeah. So that's sort of just how the six steps break down. Yeah, and then the, one of the things that interested me was the idea of you can't get to deployment if you don't have um, the folks who are non-technical yeah. in the totally. process, and certainly, you know, we are kind of a low level, even though we're a TV station, we're sort of a low level tech but that idea that tech leads is always something that you're like, which which side has to lead? Is tech yeah. leading or our community needs leading or our staff needs leading? And how do those folks cross over? And so there were some, there were some general applications around tech integration that I thought were sort of interesting in this. Yeah. I just wonder if you can talk more about that. Well, in general, tech is for us. And you and me, we're, for example, humans, right? Yeah, sort of, right? We yeah. build, we, the human race, build machines to help us as humans. If we're an organization, that's an organization of humans first, right? It uses machines. Anything we're doing with technology is meant to serve the humans. The humans are in charge. The humans are the ones uh, who understand the general context and purpose of the organization. Although, so, we, as humans, we speak different languages, and it does sometimes feel like folks who understand tech deeply mm -hmm. speak their own language or on tech as opposed to, right, sociology. Yeah, so there's this big the gap. Or, yeah, like, and the gap is kind of like, you know, like uh, physicians use a lot of lingo as a part of protecting their status as an expert. And it's the same thing with yeah. any kind of information technology, right, including analytics and and all this number crunching stuff. And that's what I'm trying to do with this book, right? And with my previous book too, Predictive Analytics, is to bridge that gap by presenting all the content in plain language that's accessible, relevant, and, and, and hopefully in a way that's interesting to, to, to the non-data scientists. So how has the book been received so far? And have you seen impacts or use case scenarios? Have folks come to you? Have you seen oh, yeah. places where it's being these ideas are being implemented and having an effect? 
Yeah, so my first book, I kind of had this big opportunity with the first book because there hadn't been a book entitled Predictive Analytics, which at the time was the up and coming term. Before that, it was called data mining, which I think is a terrible term for it. Machine learning at the time was arcane and only uh, research and development or university academic word. Um, so much to my surprise and delight, that came out. And then much to my dismay, AI has become a big term. I think it's an intrinsically misleading term for the reasons we discussed. So my first book got to be the first book for all for business readers on predictive analytics. Nowadays, there's so many uh, books on AI. I didn't have quite the same splash opportunity, but within the machine learning community, I think it's been adopted very well. I think there's a great need for an established play playbook or framework that's that's known not just to the techies, but to the business people. Um, so I don't know how to characterize it. My first book sold 100,000 copies and has been adopted at hundreds of universities. This book's still new, it just came out in February, but it's been the top, for example, audiobook. It's been in and out the number one position on Amazon for data science. Um, I get a few fan messages out of the blue a week. You know, I, uh, 15 paid speaking engagements so far this, this year. Yeah. So. It's going well. I think it's serving a, a, an important need. And is there um, something that helped you to launch Gooder AI from this? Is this like yeah? I said Gooder Gooder AI totally fits in with <clears throat> this. Um, so this book is about the general business practice, right? It's not just the technology and the tools and the technical methods, but the business practice to actually make use of that technology. Within that, what we actually really have to care about, obvious, it seems obvious, is how good is AI. How do you measure it? What's the numbers that you should put on it, right? It's actually uh, dealt with a lot less than you might expect. And what happens is with these models, so that's the value proposition I met, mentioned. You're trying to predict who's going to click buy, lie, or die, right? Well, how well does it predict? It's not a magic crystal ball. These are things that you can only put odds on. And it turns out that you get value by predicting better than guessing. And that's generally what, what improves for managing fraud and for marketing and for sales and for targeting ads and, and insurance and, and targeting fundraising. And all these pro processes improve greatly and, and really contribute to the bottom line by improving better than guessing. Now that's a fine concept. Um, most business people understand it, but the next thing you need to know is, well, exactly how much better than guessing and what kind of numbers do you put, that, mm -hmm. put on that? That's very rarely done. What generally happens is a data scientist says, hey, I made the model for you, so now you can t target, you can improve your fraud detection proce process. And then the business manager says, great, how good is it? How good is the model? And then the data scientist said, well, the, says the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve is 0.87, isn't that uh -huh. amazing? And I'm, I'm not, I mean, I know it sounds yeah. like a joke, but this is literally yeah. what happens routinely. And the, and the business state goes, well, can you translate that into English? Or could you translate that into, how much will we save yeah. as far as targeting? You know, we've got this team of fraud auditors. We need to target their efforts more effectively. What's the bottom line for the organizational key performance indicator? How much more uh, fundraising uh, uh, will we do by targeting our fundraising efforts? And so whatever it is, what's the KPI? Translating it to that key performance indicator, profit savings, whatever, that's generally not done. A major reason why most of these projects fail to actually reach deployment and those failures are swept under the rug. So at Gooder AI, we're doing that. It's the first full scale solution for taking a model and not just evaluating it, but evaluating so it. So we're using predictive analytics to to no, you're not using. Okay. No, this is a this is not the rocket science. It's about how well the rocket performs in its intended okay. usage. Okay. So you can say, hey, do we need to change the design of this thing? Do we so have to make a new the model? Translators, are you working as the yeah, kind of? Yeah, it's directly going to inform what the translators <laughs> need to know. Yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, I'll, I have two, a couple of questions. One is, what? How is this relevant to small scale nonprofits, small businesses, folks that don't have resources? They don't. They're not going to build their own predictive analytics. They may use tools mm -hmm. that are provided to them. But do you have thoughts on that? How? Yeah. Well, let me answer that in two parts. I'll come to the generative in a second because yeah. generative anybody can just use sure. it instantly. In fact, yeah. sometimes I just pull it up and ask it questions. Um, uh, but in terms of predictive. The thing that uh, tells you whether it's going to be valuable isn't necessarily the size of the organization, but the size of the process. So if you're some small uh, organization that does one major mailing a year, 
you're selling candy for a holiday catalog, uh, you're doing a major fundraiser once a year, uh, but your prospect list has 100,000 or a million on it. That's the thing that matters. That's where you've got the scale. And because it's a large operation in that sense, you've got history from which to learn, right? You did this, you did this outreach to this number of prospects last year and you found out who did or didn't respond. That's experience from which to learn. That's what's called literally called the training data that machine learning operates on. So now you can uh, generate a predictive model and use it to score individuals and rank them and prioritize them. And you can decide exactly where you should draw the line. How much more effective could the overall practice be if you only if you only expend the cost of contact to the top 20% or something like that. And those are the numbers games that you can start to play. And that depends on the size of the operation, not the size of the organization. Well, but in, in our case, we would have to rely on a third party software as a service or somebody who's providing that. So our yes. content management, you know, our constituent management system would have to offer that as a way. We'll look back at your data, we'll tell you who you should. Right, but even if you're going external, it still hinges with those types of the predictive use cases. Generally, it's about making use of the data that that organization has, yeah. so that it, the results are very much customized to improve for your particular practice, your operations, your product, or whatever, what, and your list of prospects. And if that the size of that data is, is big enough, great. Whether you're doing doing it internally or externally, you kind of need enough data. So if the operations are big enough, the data is going to turn out to be big enough. So it's an argument to make sure you're keeping track of data. Yeah. You're yeah, tracking sure. it somewhere, even if you're not sure how you're going to use it today. Exactly, and in general, that's what, what was, you know, in more recent years called the big data movement. The thing that's big about data is its potential value. And in general, it's an illusion, and, and predictive analytics is, is a part of this. Um, an allusion to the idea that you're making hay of data that was essentially collected as a byproduct of doing business as usual. Yeah. So it's found data in that respect. So it's like, hey, look, we've kind of collected all this residual information from the process. Actually, that's experience from which to learn. Yeah. So you, yes, and you want it to be relatively organized if possible. Great. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about what we refer to or what I've heard referred to as this kind of scary issues of AI, mm -hmm. the resource consumption that it takes. Mm. I think we uh, that's ethics. A, that's a great question. So job loss. I think that the unforeseen impacts. You know, I think, deployment. You know, and, I got on a soapbox uh, uh, with you here a few minutes ago. Uh -huh. I'm saying, like, come on, people, let's calm down the hype. There's a myth. There's a mythology saying, hey, this thing is really going to become human-like in a broad sense of the word general capacity of human, wholesale replacement of human, like that message. We gotta take care of the, the humans that are here already before we create well, new ones. Well, but that the, my, what I'm saying, the water. <laughs> yes, true, but what I'm saying is that we are not creating new humans. So yeah. I think it's an important yeah. piece of the equation. How much resources should we be investing in this thing that's supposed to be a panacea, right? A magic bullet, that because if it is fully human-like and you don't have to, you don't have, it doesn't have to sleep and it doesn't make errors and it can, it can solve anything as well as any human, right? That's like a magic being that could be extremely valuable, but to the degree we get sober, right? To the degree we, we avoid the elation, the, the uh, intoxication or fear, those altered states by being concrete about what actually is feasible, then we're gonna realize, well, this thing is really cool from a scientific standpoint, but it's not going to be that valuable. Now, in that context, let's revisit the question you just brought up: is how much research is, should we be putting into yeah. this thing? Well, I, and I, you know, I don't know the specific information, but there's the the idea that you know the water that's used to cool the servers that are yeah. generating your yep. funny cat, you know, your, your <laughs> fake cat images yeah. in ChatGPT is kind of um, criminal and astronomical. You know, um, I mean, it, it goes hand in hand. The sort of um, indifference to resource consumption goes hand in hand with the apparent indifference to, to financial consumption. Because right now, the companies that are just feeding the hype cycle are, are just pouring incredible amounts of billions and billions of dollars. You know, Microsoft, OpenAI, I mean, these these companies are just betting the farm on something that to me, I believe, is a ghost story. This is, this is the novel that Mary Shelley would have written if she knew about algorithms. 
So I guess this leads to the question of how do citizens prepare themselves for these big ideas, both you know in our day-to-day -day work, but also as um, folks that are going to be, um, you know, have this kind of fun cat toy played out in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, and what is it, how does it affect media literacy needs? You know, for an organization like ours, we've done media literacy around, you know, how to read the uh, pro how to read the media that you're consuming, and mm -hmm. this just adds a whole other layer. So I wonder if you can talk just a little bit about that. I'd say first and foremost, it's about um, pushing against the tide to say, hey, look, skepticism, press, people like me, what I've been saying today, in terms of just sort of really how intelligent is it going to get and human-like, um, there's a lot of us, but we have much quieter voices than these powerful companies that have a financial incentive to fuel a hype machine even if it's ultimately misleading hype. They're very powerful. AI as a brand has been in sort of intrinsically misleading in these ways and extremely powerful since that term was coined in the 50s. Um, so I think it's really important to say, hey, look, there's lots of great writing on the skepticism side. Let's just sort of do a little search and bump that up so that to sort of compensate against the sort of uh, content most people are going to see on mainstream media, which is so much fueled by, by the money system, right, Where, which goes hand in hand with basically over-promising. So let's be realistic about how good this stuff is. And, um, on the other hand, don't be at the, by, the, by the same token, don't be afraid of it. It's not going to just take, you can't replace humans with it in general. Um, and it's not going to get its own sentience or volition or, you know, robo-apocalyptic kind of uh, scenarios. Th those are fictional. So play with it. Definitely go use uh, ChatGPT or anything like I, the one I've been using recently is the meta one on Messenger, it's right there in my Messenger. If you so ever, that, there's no reason it, not to play with it. Yeah. There isn't. Well, so that's a. I mean, that is to me a question. Like, is there? I mean, are there reasons to say, yeah, we're not going to use this in our organization because of the resource consumption, or we're yeah, not going to sure. use this because, sure. or we're going to understand it. But well, we're no, I think you've into... asked the question. I think you've asked a, a really important question. I'm not prepared to answer. Right. Yeah. So you could say, "Hey, look, we shouldn't be having as bright lights, and we shouldn't be using electricity between the hours of five and seven, and all that kind of thing." How much does it consume every time I do a little question on the, the, the with with well, now with when you generative? Google, it does, it's like the top search now is this is an AI search. Right. So the same same yeah. thing. But when it uses one of those generative models to create new paragraph of copy or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, how much resource is it using? I've seen some data about that. Do keep in mind, though, that the real energy consumption is creating that model in the first place. Yeah. That, that, that costs millions and millions of dollars and, and a lot of resources to learn from an extremely amount, large amount of data to make the model. Then actually using the model, and this is true also with the predictive use cases, although on a much smaller scale. It takes a while. It can take an hour. It can take a, a few minutes or it can take a day to make a model from a lot of data, but then using the model is, is like that. It can instantly make decisions, and it's a lot less resource intensive. Um, the same kind of relative uh, um, imbalance is there. So when you're actually just having it like write a new paragraph or answer a question with a, a few sentences or what have you, that's not consuming nearly as much energy as its existence in the first place took. Um, but it does consume some, right? Yeah. So. Um, I'm not prepared to answer the question. I don't, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but if you're making boycott decisions about energy consumption, that should be part of the equation. It's an, yeah, that's an interesting thought. The, um, the last thing I just want to ask you is going back to this idea of predictive um, data and how to integrate that into smaller organizations and are there resources that folks should lean on when they're looking at strategic planning decisions, business planning decisions, fundraising decisions mm -hmm. with their, you know, how do you pool your limited set of resources mm -hmm. alongside others? Do you have any thoughts on that for smaller businesses, yeah. smaller 
organizations? Well, so the, the value proposition, you need to have some sense of exactly how is this thing going to be valuable. So if I have uh, 200,000 prospects as potential investors, I'm actually working with an organization that serves uh, m more than 100 nonprofits, some of them very large for very large fundraising efforts. Um, and, uh, but if, if, let's say, you were one of those nonprofits, for example, um, you have this large, relatively large prospect list. You know, what would you want to do? Would you want to sort of predict who's going to donate more than twenty dollars, and then you and then what would you know? You could do some scratch calculations. How much could that improve the bottom line value or profit of a fundraising uh, mail campaign, something like that? Um, have a sense very specifically how you're going to do it, and then the first step with actual number crunching would be, okay, well, let's make a scratch model and see how well it could predict and then do more informed scratch calculations. Now, the actual making of the model, that part is where you need a data scientist who's experienced, but potentially for relatively light engagement. Um, the, the biggest technical part of these projects is is preparing the data. So taking that data that you have, in whatever form and format, and putting in sort of a nicer, clean, meaningful format so that you can then do the modeling. Mm -hmm. That's not the, that's sort of the, the, the data preparation part that's a necessary evil, but it's not the core rocket science. The core rocket science itself um, uh, takes an expert, and that can be a part of sort of a feasibility, um, sort of a quick pass, you know, pilot, a feasibility analysis or what have you. But I mean, it's sort of so it's incremental. You need to start exactly. How am I going to? Don't don't do AI. Don't be like, hey, we got to use the best technology because everyone's doing it and it's hyped and we're fear of missing out. No, you need to have a very concrete way that this could be valuable and then take it from there one step at a time. Great, Eric Siegel, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, and for those who are interested, you could uh, learn more at bizml.com or Gooder. AI.com, is that correct? Gooder.ai. Gooder.ai. Yeah. Um, and thanks for watching. Thanks, Meg.